part plane, part helicopter. The V-22 Osprey is one of a kind. And it's in a completely different league. Her journey from sketch to sky has been fought with red tape and tragedy. Tens of billions spent. We knew what the aircraft could do, and that's where our focus was. Dozens of lives lost. Oh, my God, they went down, they crashed. Now we bring you the inside story, how the Osprey transformed itself from one of the most controversial aircraft ever built. Its political viability was questioned. Into a combat-hardened lifesaver. November 8th, 2013. Typhoon Haiyan rips through the Philippines. It's the strongest storm ever to make landfall. Devastating winds whip over the land at 170 miles per hour. The surging sea leaves mud and death in its wake. So it's a 15 to 25 foot wave came across entire villages. And so everything is wiped out. The body count grows with each hour that passes. The UN says 11 million people have been displaced. I have seen was a total destruction. Uh, more than one million houses have been completely destroyed. Relief supplies pour in from around the world but getting it to the people who need it most is a challenge. Day after day, they kept bringing more and more cargo, and they just kept stacking it up on the tarmac right beside the other aid and supplies. The Philippine Army tries to distribute the aid, but they quickly find themselves in need of support. The Philippine Army were utilizing um, older model Hueys, and they didn't have the range to get out to some of the more isolated areas. People dying, supplies laid to waste, Relief organizers need an answer fast. The solution comes from the Marine Corps' one-of-a-kind aircraft, the V-22 Osprey. The Osprey is in a league of its own. It's not a plane, and it's not a helicopter. The Osprey is a tilt rotor, meaning it's an aircraft that can do the jobs of both. Tilt rotor aircraft gives us tremendous capabilities that an airplane has as far as speed and range. Uniquely, we can land in a hover just like a helicopter could. So we can land in a lot of places that an airplane can't land. Its tilt rotor capabilities give the Osprey another advantage when it's needed quickly. They allow it to self-deploy. The idea of self-deployment is, is that you just gas it up and fly there. All airplanes self-deploy because they can carry the fuel and they can fly long ranges. Helicopters fundamentally don't have the range that a fixed-wing aircraft. But the tilt rotor Osprey is a bird of a different color. The V-22, because it, in forward flight, it flies like a fixed wing, it has a much longer uh, deployable range than a conventional helicopter. So a V-22 can now pretty much self-deploy anywhere around the world. Uh, the world. November 10th, 2013. Okinawa, Japan. 900 miles away from the devastation in the Philippines, Osprey pilots at Marine Corps Station Futenma receive orders to prep their birds for deployment. Commanders dub the mission Operation Damayan, a Filipino word meaning help in the time of need. As soon as we got the approval to go help and assist, uh, we were able to launch the same day. The United States Marine Corps is well known as the first to the fight. They're often the first boots on the ground in humanitarian disasters, too. The Marine Expeditionary Force out there was certainly tracking the, uh, the impending arrival of the storm. So within only a day, the first Marine relief efforts started to deploy. Fully loaded, 
the Osprey has a range of 450 miles. But the 900-mile flight from Okinawa to the Philippines won't stop the Osprey from getting there fast. That's because it can do something most helicopters can't, refuel mid-air. Each Osprey squadron is supported by a C-130 refueling aircraft. We have what's called a refuel area commander, and that'll be a C-130 pilot, and he has a special qualification and a special skill. Halfway through their flight, the Ospreys must refuel. Even with hours of practice, it's a risky aerial ballet. The Osprey carefully aligns with the C-130. They fly a mere 15 feet away from each other at 230 miles per hour. Two hazards complicate the refueling process. The Osprey's powerful twin rotors, 38-foot blades spinning at 333 revolutions per minute. Halfway through its journey, the C-130 crew extends a fuel hose. The Osprey moves close to lock on. You're definitely concerned about potential hazards. Worst case scenario, prop rotor blade contacting the C-130. The C-130 and the Osprey execute the refueling maneuver flawlessly. But much greater challenges await. Just four hours after takeoff, the Ospreys arrive in the Philippines. Their first assignment, provide aid to a remote village 360 miles south of Manila. The very first day operation I flew down to the, the most affected areas was pretty surreal. Um, it, it doesn't even seem like it's a reality, what you're seeing. It seems like something that you might see on TV or, or from a movie. And it's, it's kind of hard for your brain to compute that this is really happening in front of you. Marine pilots don't know where they'll touch down once they reach their destination. And you're really flying an aircraft into an area that basically is completely flattened. We didn't know whether we were actually going to be able to get in there. In situations like this, the Osprey relies on its precision landing capability which comes from two identical engine pods called nacelles. The nacelles are the Osprey's most identifiable features. They contain the rotors and perform a key function, vertical takeoff and landing. How the nacelles help us to take off vertically is they place the rotor head in an upward fashion to direct the thrust down into the ground. Position the nacelles to 90 degrees and the rotors shift to helicopter mode for takeoff and landing. Position them to zero degrees and the Osprey transitions to plane mode. It's an impressive engineering feat. What allows the nacelles to move is the hydraulic power drive unit and the ball and jack assembly, which you can see up here just to the inside of the nacelle where it joins the wing root. A hydraulic drive connects the nacelle's engines through a shaft in the Osprey's wings. It pushes the nacelles forward or back as needed, transforming the Osprey in as little as 15 seconds. If one engine fails, the second engine can still operate both rotors. It's a safety feature that may save the lives of those on board. Even more amazing, the entire complex operation is controlled by just one small lever in the Osprey's cockpit. On this thrust control lever, this gray wheel that my left thumb sits on is what moves the nacelles. This right here is our hottest commodity to a pilot in the V-22 community, or in the Osprey community, uh, your left thumb, because without it, you cannot fly this aircraft. In the Philippines, Captain Nelson carefully adjusts the nacelles. This is the moment that defines the Osprey, the moment when it turns from a plane into a helicopter. There was a small little clearing of palm trees, basically. Um, they'd all been kind of leveled away, and there was enough room for us to just kind of land directly straight down into the trees. As they ease the aircraft onto the ground, the Osprey's crew surveys the nearby area. It's eerily quiet. 
when you're employing the aircraft in a humanitarian assistance scenario. I mean, you, you just got to be ready for pretty much anything. You can have desperate folks who are trying to get to your airplane rapidly. As soon as the Osprey touches down, frantic survivors pour out of the destroyed village. You get to a certain point in the days where um, people stop being hungry and thirsty and they start getting desperate. Sharp rotors, hot, powerful engines. All it takes is one mistake to turn the humanitarian relief mission into a disaster. Marines try to keep control of the situation. Suddenly, the crowd starts to turn. As the Osprey crew tries to deliver food and water to typhoon survivors in the Philippines, desperate mobs threaten to overrun them. We're concerned with people getting too close to the aircraft because it is a, a dangerous environment to be around. Frantic villagers grab for whatever they can. The supplies go quickly. Another plane might be overwhelmed by the swarming crowd. But the tilt rotor Osprey has a built-in escape feature. Adding a little left hand power there, and uh, the airplane pop right up. It's part of the flexibility of a vertical takeoff and landing. Being a part of this mission was a huge privilege for me. I'd been waiting a long time, really, to be able to, to help people. You know, that's why a lot of guys become Marines. You want to help people that can't help themselves, uh, defend people that can't defend themselves. In their first 24 hours, the Ospreys deliver over 66,000 pounds of aid to the stricken Philippines. And for the next two weeks, pilots and maintainers work tirelessly around the clock. The squadrons that deployed there flew uh, over 350 hours in uh, relief. For a normal full squadron, that's typically uh, a month's worth of flying. They did it in a couple weeks. Large payloads, long distances, fast. That's the Osprey's specialty, its primary purpose. Before the Osprey, Marine aircraft struggled to deliver. Their existing fleet of helicopters lacked the range to do their job, leading to one of the Marines' most infamous and unforgettable failures. November 1979, Tehran, Iran. The U.S. Embassy is under siege. Angry Iranian students accuse the United States of undermining their revolution. The students take 66 U.S. diplomats hostage. They demand the return of the recently overthrown Shah hiding in the U.S. The U.S. balks at the request. We refuse to permit the use of terrorism and the seizure and the holding of hostages to impose political demands. In the middle of the Persian Gulf, United States supercarrier USS Nimitz starts buzzing with activity. After two months of practice, the clock is about to start on a top secret mission, Operation Eagle Claw. Operation Eagle Claw was a rescue attempt for the hostages that were being held in the US Embassy in Tehran. This particular mission was perhaps the most complicated that was ever attempted by US Special Forces. One thing that makes the rescue so complicated, the embassy's location. Tehran and its suburbs are surrounded by more than 700 miles of sand. The distances were so great, there was no helicopter available that could cover the distance in one hop. Getting the choppers directly into the city seems like an impossible task. So commanders come up with a daring strategy. Marine pilots will use the empty desert to their advantage. The solution was to create a refueling point out in the desert, many hundreds of miles out in the desert from Tehran. The refueling location is top secret. Its code name, Desert One. At Desert One, Air Force C-130s would bring in fuel for the Marine helicopter crews, which would then uh, stage to another site in preparation for the transport of the hostages. The mission involves over 100 US troops and a dozen aircraft. It was essentially turning much of central and northern Iran into a complex chessboard, uh, moving these pieces around over about a 48-hour period. It's a risky plan 
but the mission needs to work. American lives depend on it. April 24th, 1980. At twilight, eight helicopters take off from the USS Nimitz, headed for Desert One. Not long into their flight, two of them notice something wrong. Of the eight aircraft that were sent in, two had to abort on the way. They ran into essentially a sandstorm uh, that caused some problems. Only six choppers are left. Four hours after takeoff, they finally arrive. But their trouble is far from over. Another aircraft, upon arrival at Desert One, was damaged. At that point, uh, only five of the eight aircraft were available. That was below the minimum considered necessary to complete the mission. And so at that point, a decision was made to abort the mission. U.S. troops and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of military equipment are now in limbo behind enemy lines. Commanders know the top secret location won't stay that way for long. As the military scrambles to get everyone out, the unthinkable occurs. As uh, one of the helicopters was repositioning, it drifted in the darkness into the wing of a C-130. Military personnel frantically evacuate using the surviving C-130s. They leave five damaged choppers behind and something much worse. To my deep regret, eight of the crewmen of the two aircraft which collided were killed, and several other Americans were hurt in the accident. The failed operation humiliates America, and especially the Marines. If they'd been flying a better aircraft, things might have been different. Desert One actually confirmed what the Marine Corps had believed all along and for many years. We needed a high-speed, long-range aircraft with a vertical takeoff capability. If we'd had one at that time, it would have been possible to execute that mission in one night and, uh, and be out of there. The Pentagon agrees. In December 1981, they start the Joint Service Vertical Takeoff and Landing Experimental Program, JVX for short. The JVX program was launched to create a new type of joint vertical takeoff and landing aircraft that could be used across different military services. Each branch of the armed forces contributes four and a half million dollars. The Army wanted a new uh, electronic warfare aircraft. Uh, the Navy was looking for a new uh, fleet support aircraft. And the Air Force wanted a new aircraft for their special missions capability. The Marines want the JVX even more than the others. They've been fighting for a long-range chopper for over 20 years. One of the key developments during the 1960s was the uh, increased use of what are known as anti-shipping missiles. These are uh, land-based missiles that are designed to attack ships some distance offshore. This really complicated uh, the Marine Corps doctrine of amphibious assault. The new missiles forced the Marines to anchor farther out to sea, too far for their CH-46 choppers to be effective. The CH-46 Sea Knight was a very capable helicopter for the time, but with the advent of anti-shipping missiles, this aircraft really struggled to deliver Marines to the destinations that they needed to be. The Marines pride themselves on being America's first responders, but without a better aircraft to get them to the battlefield, they have no way to meet their mission. The Marines were highly dependent upon the success of the JVX program. Their existing fleet of aircraft was beginning to age. It did not have the capability that they really needed to have successful operations. Congress issues a request for proposals. Only one comes in, a collaboration between Bell Helicopter and Boeing Aircraft. Bell Helicopters was very experienced in building smaller helicopters, but they were not particularly experienced in building large transport helicopters. Boeing was very experienced in this field, and so Bell partnered with Boeing. May 23, 1988, Arlington, Texas. 
Bell Boeing spares no expense for the debut of their pioneering design. When the V-22 Osprey rolls out, top government officials and a crowd of 1,600 people witness the historic moment. Few in the world have ever seen such a strange-looking aircraft. The first thing that pilots notice is the Osprey's unique rotor and wing system, designed specifically for marine transport. In order to reduce the footprint of the aircraft to something that will fit on the ships, what we try to do is get the aircraft down to just as wide as you can see here when you're looking head on. The width of the Osprey extends 84 feet. But in an instant, the Osprey changes shape. With the nacelles in a 90-degree position, the rotor blades fold inward, rotate the nacelles again, and the entire wing turns 90 degrees in line with the body of the Osprey. The transformation is complete in 90 seconds or less. The stowed width is a mere 18 and a half feet. It's extremely functional for us on the boat. By the time we land, shut down, and fold the aircraft, usually your tow crews are already hooked up and starting to drag you off the spot. The Osprey flies at twice the speed of any other military helicopter, up to 316 miles per hour. That's thanks to two 6,150 horsepower Rolls-Royce engines. As far as the amount of power that the aircraft provides, uh, if you're standing below the aircraft when we take off, it would be the equivalent of standing in about an 80 to 100 mile an hour wind. So there is a lot of force that's created by these engines. They're extremely powerful. Powerful engines get the Osprey to the fight fast, and powerful weapons protect it once it's there. Should it come under fire, the Osprey's main defense is either a 50 caliber or 7.62 millimeter machine gun. Once we are approaching a zone and we're getting ready, we need to have the, man, the weapon manned. What we'll do is we'll pull a pin. And then the crew chief will be on the ramp. The ramp will be level and the crew chief will be manning the weapon and we'll just be able to scan the entrance into the area where we're going for any kind of a hostile target if we need to. It looks like the JVX program has delivered the goods, but all this fancy technology comes at a price. When it debuts, the Osprey is already a $2 billion program. Manufacturers calculate future costs will skyrocket to 15 times more. The Marines are desperate for the Osprey and confident the aircraft will be worth the price. But the Army reviews the program and drops out. They were doing a major restructuring, modernization of their entire helicopter fleet. It was essentially a budget decision for them. With the largest branch of the service out of the picture, the burden to fund the program now falls on the back of the smallest, the Marines. When the Army dropped out, it greatly increased the unit costs of the Osprey for the Marine Corps. The Osprey's rising costs also score some enemies, including the new Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney. The Department of Defense was looking for a program to kill at that time, a major program. And uh, Mr. Cheney was advised that the Osprey would be a good one to kill. The Marines find themselves battling to defend their program. But no sooner has the fight started than the world sees this. This is the maiden test flight of Osprey prototype number five. Miraculously, the two men inside escape, but the aircraft is completely destroyed. Questions quickly arise. What could have caused such a devastating crash just minutes after takeoff? A post-mortem reveals that the flight control system had been miswired. Examination of Osprey prototypes one and three reveal a similar problem. Bell Boeing rushes to correct it and promises to do better. Accountability issues, cost overruns, 
the osprey looks like a bird with its head on the chopping block. Anytime you have a problem in a program, everybody starts looking to take your money and move it somewhere else. But the Marines have waited a long time for this aircraft. They won't give it up easily. Their very reason for existence depends on the new technology. Without a new chopper, they can't be first to the fight. But well, we eventually got to the point where we had all our eggs in one basket, and it was the Osprey. We had to have it. The Marine Corps was adamant that they have an aircraft that allowed it to perform its mission. Marines are, have a difficult time giving up on an objective. Tenacity is a better word than stubbornness. No, Marines don't quit. The White House and Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney don't see things the same way. We don't want to build a V-22. We want to go back to a more conventional approach. The Marines press Congress for support. Congress delivers, threatening to slap Cheney with a lawsuit for shutting the Osprey down. Congress has always been our friend, because I think people recognize that the Marine Corps gives them the maximum bang for the buck. And uh, when you invest money in the Marines, they, they produce. The threat works. Cheney backs down. After three years in limbo, the Osprey program is back in development. It seems like the Marines are finally on their way to getting the long-awaited aircraft. But the celebrations are short-lived. July 20th, 1992. The Marine Air Facility in Quantico, Virginia. One of five Osprey prototypes undergoes flight testing. About a half a mile from the runway, the Osprey suddenly drops right into the Potomac River. It was clear that nobody was going to get out under the circumstances the way it went in. Three Marine pilots and four Boeing contractors die. The Department of Defense grounds the four remaining Ospreys while they look for the cause. Oil had been leaking into the nacelle, and when they rotated the nacelle to the vertical position, the engine ingested the oil, had a flash fire, and it crashed. The Osprey program reels from the tragedy. Congress threatens to withdraw support. If it's a system problem in the technology, then it could mean major problems for the program. A month later, the Osprey becomes a campaign issue. President Bush's Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, is still lukewarm on the aircraft. Bush's challenger, Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton, supports it. We're going to have to spend more money in the future on military technology and on greater mobility, greater airlift, greater sea lift, the V-22 airplane. We're going to have to do some things that are quite costly. Clinton wins the election, and Osprey supporters breathe a sigh of relief. The program's considered a lock. The Osprey had a roller coaster ride of political turmoil and media scrutiny. During the Clinton administration, things began to turn around. The Osprey program begins eight years of operational and evaluation testing. But just a month before they complete those tests, an impending disaster might end the Marines' quest for the tilt rotor once and for all. April, Yuma, Arizona. The Osprey takes off on an evaluation mission to show how it performs in combat. It doesn't get far. Oh my God, they went down, they crashed. The year 2000 uh, was a pretty terrible year for anybody who had anything to do with, uh, with the V-22 Osprey. We had two mishaps, um, uh, tragic mishaps. Still very few details coming out of the Pentagon this morning about that crash that killed 19 Marines, 15 combat troops, and four crew members. The Osprey is cleared from mechanical fault. Investigators find that the aircraft descended too quickly at too low an airspeed. Pilots attempted to increase power and threw the Osprey into a deadly stall. The Marine Corps is shaken. The prize they fought so hard for now has 26 fatalities to its name. It was a very dark time, uh, a lot of soul searching, I think, uh, for anyone who had anything to do with the program. In December, it gets worse. A routine training mission in North Carolina goes terribly wrong. 
four more Marines lose their lives. This time, a leak in a hydraulic line set off a chain of mechanical malfunctions, causing the pilot to lose control of the aircraft. Speculations swirl on the Osprey's reliability. The Marines who died were among their most experienced pilots. Once those Marines were killed, the whole game changed in terms of everybody was saying, wait a minute, is this the airplane we need to develop? The crash makes for an embarrassing headline. Why do the Marines keep throwing money at a program that can't seem to get off the ground? Most modern aircraft programs have a checkered past in terms of having accidents on record. Invariably, because these aircraft are so expensive, anytime they suffer these accidents, there tends to be a lot of negative media attention on them, asking the question of whether uh, these programs are worth the money that's being invested in them. And certainly with, with Osprey uh, having a series of fatal crashes, this raised a lot of questions and created a lot of negative media scrutiny. The Secretary of Defense immediately calls for a panel of experts to investigate what some now call the Widowmaker. I met with the Commandant and I, I said, we're going to get the truth. No matter how it comes out, we're going to present it. He said, that's exactly what I want you to do. The panel is determined to prevent any more deaths, even if it means killing the Osprey itself. April 19th, 2001. Washington, D.C. The Blue Ribbon Committee releases its findings. We found no evidence of an inherent safety flaw in the V-22 tilt rotor concept. The airplane was found to be guiltless in terms of what had been happening with it. It was not the performance or the technical capabilities of the airplane that were at fault. The fault doesn't lie with the machine, but rather with poor pilot training. We had underestimated some of the requirements for preparing crews uh, to operate this aircraft. It immediately gave us a wake-up call that we had to think more about the preparation of these crews. The panel recommends a series of redesigns. The aim, to make the Osprey easier for pilots and maintainers to operate. They completely redesigned the nacelle to make it bigger and more uh, accessible, more inspection panels in places where you could see, where you couldn't see before. The panel also recommends more rigorous preparation for pilots and maintainers. Now, the Marines send their Osprey crews to the prestigious training squadron, MOTS-1. MOTS stands for Marine Aviation Weapons and Tactics Squadron 1. It is the Marine Corps Weapons School, uh, very similar to things like Navy's Top Gun or the Air Force Weapons School. MOTS 1 motto is, today's student, tomorrow's leader. In between, they make it tough. It is the hardest thing I've had to do uh, in my Marine Corps career, going through WTI as a student. In the grueling eight-week course, crews learn everything there is to know about the Osprey and its capabilities. We expose them to a lot of events that they can't get exposed to back in the fleet. And that's by design so that when they get out to the real world, if things happen, they have some sort of experience to fall back upon. Crews fly mock missions of every type of operation the Osprey may be used for around the world, like transporting troops for assault support and humanitarian assistance. So we try to take current missions that are going on around the world that can be employed and expose the students to that. It's training they wouldn't get anywhere else but here. Graduates from MOTS become weapons and tactics instructors. They are equipped on how to operate the Osprey under any circumstance and take this valuable info back to their home squadrons to train others. When you leave WTI, you owe a payback 12 months to 18 months uh, due to the assets required and the timeline required to train you up. They don't want to train you and then send you off to do something else. They want you to actually pay back the squadron, standardize the squadron, and then move forward and get them combat ready. But training and combat are two different things. The Osprey has yet to be tested in battle. September 10th, 2007, Iraq. Operation Iraqi Freedom rages into its fourth year. 
from inside Fallujah, 4,000 Marines try to win back the rest of Al Anbar province. To do that, they need to gain control of an area covering 53,000 square miles. There was just a high demand for getting Marines all over the battlefield. A lot of demand for exactly the kind of thing that the V-22 offered. It's the moment the Marines have been waiting for. Time to show the world the true nature of their $69 million bird. We'd been training with the aircraft uh, for an extended period of time. Uh, we felt like we were ready, and uh, it was, you know, we knew it was coming. That's what we prepared for. We were ready to go. 10 Ospreys set sail for Iraq aboard the USS Wasp. Excitement is high among pilots and crews. But halfway there, the crew gets some devastating news. After 18 years of testing, the V-22 is finally on its way to make its combat debut. But the celebration is short-lived. Marines on their way to Iraq see this. Time magazine features the Osprey's mishaps and cost overruns on its cover. It seems as if the Osprey's failure in Iraq is a foregone conclusion, dismissed before it's even had a chance to get in the fight. The Time magazine cover that came out, uh, while we had already embarked aboard ship and were sailing over to Iraq, uh, was not particularly well received. We saw it as, you know, it was, it, was, it was somewhat insulting and annoying. The Ospreys of Marine Medium Tilt Rotor Squadron 263 arrive in Iraq determined to prove their worth. Commanders immediately put them to work. During 19 months in Iraq, the Ospreys shuttle over 45,000 troops and haul 2.2 million pounds of cargo. They're a lifesaver, literally. The history books will write about the uh, improvised explosive device threat in Iraq. Every time you were carrying somebody you know, from one point to another, uh, you were keeping them off the roads and not exposing them to that uh, improvised explosive device threat. So that was our mission, and uh, there was no shortage of a demand for it. But some argue the Osprey has been babied on its first deployment that it's nothing more than a glorified flying school bus. Even the Marines wonder how the Osprey sizes up in riskier combat missions. 24 months later, they find out. 2009, Helmand Province, Afghanistan. The United States is eight years into Operation Enduring Freedom. President Obama orders a surge of 17,000 troops to turn the tide against the Taliban. The fight wears on. Even with the added boots on the ground, the US Marines wage an uphill battle. But on its way is another weapon to help them in their fight, the V-22 Osprey. There were still some, I guess, some people that weren't really convinced on Osprey. We definitely got everybody's attention when we first brought the airplane in. The mag commander came in, he, he locked eyeballs with me, and he says, exploit the airplane to the maximum extent. Crews are desperate to prove the Osprey can take on dicier challenges, so desperate that the Marines are willing to use it on one of their boldest missions yet. A hundred miles from the Marine airfield in Camp Bastion, a small village is taken over by a local warlord, a safe haven for his drug operation. Money from poppy sales flows to the Taliban to buy equipment and weapons, weapons used to kill American troops. The Marines aim to stop the drug network by taking out its leadership. We had to take off the top of the network, so the people who don't normally communicate with anyone but the top of the network lose that mode of communication. So you've disrupted that network cell. The plan? To fly to the center of the remote village and insert 100 Marines to capture the warlord in broad daylight. Operation Foz Laundry was a uh, daylight uh, snatch from a little bizarre restaurant area that this particular target had been known to frequent. And uh, we wanted to go in there and do it 
in his own backyard. Here we are, and you're coming with us. The operation is risky. The Taliban has been timing U.S. aircraft. One of the things they were doing when we first got there was people around the airfields would tell other people when we had launched. And so Mr. Taliban calls his buddy saying, hey, they headed this direction. Up until now, it seems like the Taliban have had the upper hand. This particular target bragged about how the Americans can't get us down here, we're safe. This is my turf, very gangland-like, you know, I run this place. The insurgents know exactly how far and how fast the Americans can travel. They'll have weapons at the ready, and Marines know it. Anywhere you go in Afghanistan, you're expecting someone to shoot back at you. The Marines are banking on the Osprey's speed, allowing them to slip by the Taliban's lookouts. Motivation was very high. There's always a level of fear, and we were prepared to deal with it. Four V-22s take off, headed straight into the lion's den, if they're spotted by the Taliban, it could be game over. The Marines arrive at the village undetected, thanks to one of the Osprey's most surprising qualities. The thing about a V-22 people forget is in airplane mode, it's very quiet. You can't hear it come over, even low altitude. But the mission is just getting started. The Ospreys still have to land. And even if the Taliban doesn't fight back, the environment will. The Ospreys' massive engines transport the ship quickly, but there are drawbacks to its power. In the moon dust in Afghanistan, if you haven't been there, it's talcum powder. And if you blow just a little bit of wind on that, as below 75 feet with our high induced flow, which means we blow a lot of air very fast relative to other rotorcraft, we kicked up a lot of dust. The Osprey's descent whips up a thick wall of dust and sand. It's a complete brownout landing, and the pilots can't see a thing. Marine Colonel Anthony Bianca flies blind in the tornado of dust whipped up by the Osprey's rotors. Time is of the essence. The Marines risk losing their Taliban target or worse, their lives. They can't see a thing. For most aircraft, it would be the end of the mission, but not for the Osprey. It can practically land itself. That's because the Osprey is basically a flying computer. Its advanced avionics help it land even when pilots can't see. The Osprey's movements are controlled by what is called a fly-by-wire system using sensors on the Osprey's body. The system constantly collects data, such as location, airspeed, and altitude. It transmits the data to the Osprey's central computer. Then the fly-by-wire adjusts the Osprey's movements automatically. The system is so exact that the Osprey can land within one square meter of the desired landing zone. Where other aircraft would have to wave off in very dusty or difficult conditions, Boom, B-22 safe on deck. As he approaches the Afghan village, Colonel Bianca relies on the fly-by-wire to bring his Osprey in. His target still has no idea he's being watched. All we have to do at that point is concentrate on landing. The pilot chooses the moment carefully. Once the Osprey touches down, things will move quickly. Once we change the RPMs on the prop rotors to go to helicopter mode, it makes a very loud noise, and that's the first they ever heard of us. In just a matter of seconds, the Ospreys drop to the ground and unload 100 well-armed Marines. The V-22 lands right in the middle, put it right in the gate. Grunts got out, opened up the gate, walked right through. You know, pay your check, you're coming with us. And that's how we got him. The warlord never stands a chance. In under five minutes, he's in custody and sitting in the Osprey. We put 100 Marines on the ground inside of a handful of minutes and surprised the daylights out of everyone in the middle of the day. The capture is a triumph for Marines in Afghanistan. A deadly threat to their mission is locked away, all thanks to the Osprey. The Osprey goes on to fly over 14,000 flight hours during Operation Enduring Freedom. The Osprey, it works. 
And not only does it work, but when other people gain the effect, the operational capabilities of an Osprey, that's what they want. Afghanistan is a game changer. No longer is the Osprey known as a death trap. Now it's known for capture and stealth behind enemy lines, skills that will soon get put to an even more important test, saving an American life. March 2011, the USS Kearsarge, just off the coast of Libya. The 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit takes part in an international military operation against Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi. Late at night, two Osprey crews get an urgent call. An F-15 pilot has crashed behind enemy lines. He's alive. The Marines' mission, rescue him. The Marine Corps does what's called trap or tactical recovery of aircraft and personnel. The two main uh, prerequisites that we need are uh, the location known of the uh, potential survivor and reasonable certainty that the survivor is alive. Maintainers rush to ready the Osprey. Captain Joe Andrejack and his co-pilot quickly get to work on a flight plan. We were getting a lot of information as far as uh, exact location and uh, the, the threat picture, so to speak. Even with the location of the F-15 pilot known, it's a race against the clock. We were absolutely worried about the uh, uh, potential hostiles uh, on the ground there in Libya affecting the situation. The longer that that person spends uh, in, in, uh, in isolation, the, the higher the chances are that, that he or she is going to be not recovered. Intelligence places the pilot at a location 150 miles from the ship. The Osprey will have to rely on its speed to get in and out quickly. Gaddafi's air defense guns and missiles are a very real threat. Our flight from the boat uh, to Libya itself lasted about 30 minutes. Uh, and then once we were feet dry over Libya, it was about another 10 minutes to where the pilot was located. Coordinates lead the Osprey right into enemy territory. But if the Marines know the pilot's location, there's a good chance that the enemy does too. Obviously, in an uncertain situation like this, there's some amount of worry you know, happening, flying into a, a, a very uncertain scenario. The Osprey drops down just 100 feet away from the pilot. 15 recon Marines immediately rush into position. For the downed pilot, their arrival is a welcome sight. As that back door open, I see it. a group of young Marine Recon units jump out. And that was probably the best feeling I've ever felt in my entire life. The Osprey rescues the pilot before Gaddafi's forces even know it was there. He was on the back of the aircraft within a matter of seconds, and we were airborne again uh, within a minute and a half. It's the first time the Marine Corps uses the Osprey for what's called a live trap rescue. And after its performance, it surely won't be the last. The Osprey is not necessarily designed for personnel recovery or trap, but what I can tell you is the Osprey does it faster. Uh, so we did it uh, somewhere on the order of twice as fast as the next capable rotary wing platform could have done. Marines now treat the Osprey like a proven star. After 14 operational deployments and 100,000 flight hours, it has the lowest mishap rate of any marine aircraft. The aircraft is so safe that in 2013, it's chosen for its most prestigious mission yet, HMX-1. The Presidential Helicopter Squadron responsible for transporting White House staff and other VIPs. The Osprey's placement in HMX-1 is absolutely uh, a demonstration of the, the trust and confidence in the platform. Um, that's not a mission you take lightly. As good as it is right now, the Marines believe the Osprey can be even better. We're trying to use what's out there existing today and spin that to our advantage. Cutting edge civilian technology like tablets and 4G cellular networks will help pilots and crew monitor even more of their environment. 
These are never before used tools in military aviation, saving time and lives. That'll really improve our decision making, speed, and skill, and the enemy is going to find us harder to deal with because we're going to be faster than them in terms of decision making and tempo. I think that's really going to be in the future of V 22. Over the past three decades, the V 22 Osprey has seen it all. It escaped the political chopping block, outlived its reputation as a widowmaker, and transformed itself into a battle worthy veteran. Both friends and enemies alike know the Osprey can reach them anywhere in the world at any time. I have Marines that can maintain them. I got pods that can fly that daylights out of them. I can go anywhere you want, anytime you want, with anything you want. And I'm gonna bring with it a Marine Corps attitude and that type of capability. It's altered the landscape of military aviation with unrivaled capabilities and unmatched versatility. The V-22 Osprey continues to command the battlefield.